when Jason first asked us to do this, it was a little bit weird. So we're like, well, we can give talks on our research. We can give lectures for students. We've never really had this sort of conversation before. So it's a little bit so surprising to, to have us stop and, and start to reflect on, on this topic of you know, how do we do all these things. So you know, we've, we, I guess we feel like we've been successful in a lot of work stuff. You know, we have a daughter that's two. You might have seen her running around. Uh, she's here today uh, over at the daycare. Um, you know, we're reasonably good shape. Uh, we have a pretty good social life that we like to keep. Monica and Jason are good friends of ours. And so you know, we really haven't really thought about, well, how do we do it all? So when Jason had brought up the topic of the four burners, I'd never really encountered that before, and it made us think a little bit. And we were a little bit puzzled at first because we were thinking, like, do people actually do this? Do people stop and, and cut off these different burners of their life? And is that really something that we do? And you know, we actually, it was a really, really interesting exercise. And the two of us had talked together um, about um, you know, what do we do and how do we do it? So um, we're gonna have just a conversation today um, with you guys. So I'm not gonna interview the <laughs> guy I've been in love with for the last 10 years, that's a little weird. Um, so we're just gonna talk through um, tell, some <laughs> tell some stories about you know, when, what, what happened when we sort of did this exercise about reflecting on these four burners uh, and you know, what we do and some of the strategies we do, things that we do successfully and things that we don't do as successfully. Um, I don't know if there'll be any time at the end um, for uh, Q&A, but if there is, we're happy to also take your questions. But then we're, we're here through the end, of the, the end of the day tomorrow, so we're happy to follow up with any of you guys as well. Um, so just kind of starting off, um, the first reaction I had was that I've never been one of those people that really kind of, you know, th there's been the whole debate about, you know, can women have it all? And, and you know, can you be both um, a successful uh, family and a successful um, at work? And that it never occurred to me that this is something that, this is a choice that I had to make. Um, and so, you know, I had, you know, my mom worked two jobs and, you know, as long as, you know, there was love in the family, it seemed to work out okay for us. And so it never really occurred to me that that was a choice that I had to make. So it's kind of interesting for me to reflect on. Um, so I could have Shwedek talk a little bit about his reaction uh, to the, this prompt as well. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely really interesting. I, I've been <laughs> talking to some of you uh, about this format. I mean, I, I've done t a ton of technical talks. I've done a lot of talks on entrepreneurship. This is the first time I've ever reflected on how we pull everything off, family, health, uh, work, and, and how do we pull that off. And, and, and it, it, part of it is I don't think we optimized for pulling it off. It was something that we were just passionate about. And, and it's been interesting to reflect for the last couple of months. In fact, you know, we, I don't think we've ever prepped for a talk more than or for me, a, a day or two in advance. Usually if I do a keynote, it's the night before I'm trying to, and here it's, we had to prepare. And so we've been reflecting on this for, for a few months now, which has actually been interesting. Um, and, and, and just to give you a little bit of a sense of my personality, um, so I, as Jason said, I wear multiple hats. I'm a, I was, I'm a co-founder of a company. I'm chief scientist at Belkin. I'm a professor at the University of Washington. I help Microsoft build a new band product. So I do a lot of things. Um, a little, I'm a little scatterbrained at times, but I know how to focus when I need to focus. But um, but my personality is one of those things where if somebody tells me you can't do something, I'm going to do it. Um, in fact, my graduate advisor, my thesis advisor, realized this and, and, and would just do this all the time. And I finally figured out what he was doing to me. And every time he says, you can't do that, I would end up doing it. And, so that, and, and, and I'm a tinkerer. I build a lot of stuff. So I do a lot of hardware stuff, software stuff. I, I mean, you should just look at my garage. I can build anything in my garage. I mean, mechan <laughs> anything mechanical, hardware, or software. And so, so I'm all over the place. And, and when, I, when I see the notion of the four burners, it's like, there's no, and people, and often the, the people say that you gotta turn a burner off, right? How do you pull all of, it, all of it off? And my reaction is typically, no, no, we'll figure it out. I mean, I mean, it's a hard thing to do, and I like hard problems. And, um, and, and I think a lot of people think about the four burners as if, okay, you can have four burners on across your family, and then you've got it set. But I think you can go beyond that. I think each individual in the, in the household uh, or each spouse needs to be able to have all four burners on for themselves. And I think that's what's critical. And I think that's possible. And, I th and that's what we want to reflect on today. Yeah. Um, all right, so the four burners. So we put them up here just to reflect. This is our only slide. Um, so you'll be looking at this for a while. Um, just to, and also to prompt ourselves about what it, each of them It actually took us forever to figure out the right burners because uh, we were yeah, arguing about what burner. Do we want yeah, a wolf burner? Do we want whirlpool? <laughs> But this is what we settled on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I know you know what that is. I don't know what it is either. <laughs> okay. So, um, so one of the things we feel like is that the four burners are connected to each other. And then if you turn any of them off, you're going to suffer in all the other areas, which seems like a little bit obvious. But we were starting to think, you know, okay, so what if we cut off health, right? You know, it's easy to do with a kid. You know, and admittedly, we exercise a little bit less than we did before we had kids. But 
Um, and now that I'm pregnant with my second, I'm really cutting it back a little bit. But um, so, but if we cut that off, we both get really cranky. Um, and so, you know, I definitely feel like I can focus a lot better if I get uh, my morning workout in. And we both realized that we absolutely need sleep. Uh, that was very apparent early on when our daughter was first born, and we were just, you know, really, really crabby. It was like we got to figure out the sleep thing. We got to get that working. So, you know, if we cut off health, then it's going to negatively impact our other things as well. Um, for uh, me, I mean, I find a lot of really personally great identity in my, myself as a, a professor and the research that I do and working with students. And so we had this parents group that we had joined when our, our daughter was born and you know, there was a discussion about like, oh, the choice of should the mother stay home or not. And for me, I was like, that was never really up in the air for me that I would ever do that. Um, and I still get people approaching me all the time saying it's like, oh, so now that you're having a second one, you're going to you know, take time off and, and you, know, you, can, you can take time off your work and, and be with your kids, right? And I was like, no. <laughs> I mean, I love my kids and I love it, but I find a lot of identity in work. So I think if I cut off work entirely, then that would make me unhappy in a lot of other areas as well. Um, likewise with friends, you've got to have a social life to stay sane these days. Um, I think if all we did was work and, you know, no play, you know, makes Julian Schwedek an unhappy <laughs> boy and girl. <laughs> um, so you know, those are the things that, that they're really, really connected. So at least for us personally, and maybe other people are different. And I do want to kind of couch the, our conversation is that you know, this is as us as individuals, and you know, other people might have different stories. So you know, that was our first sort of realization, is that these burners are not independent of one another. Um, and so the second thing we did is that you know, one of our strategies is really just trying to combine them as much as possible. So we'll talk a little bit more as we go into the different types and our strategies is that but a lot of times we just try to combine them in a lot of ways, and that can make us more efficient. So you know, we try to find um, family, uh, try to find friends that have young kids, so we can do play dates and you know, you know, drink beer while our kids are you know, sort of playing together. Um, you know, we try to find um, you know healthy activities that we can do as a family. Um, and in fact, Schwedek actually tries to combine a lot of his tinkering stuff um, and some of his work stuff on family stuff. I also do as well with my research. I mentioned I do child development software, but um, so Schwedek has a funny story about when our daughter was about two weeks old and how he uh, decided to, to make his hobby about family. So he can share oh, that yeah, with you. Oh yeah, story. So, <laughs> so this was an interesting story where, um, so this was, Maya was about two weeks old um, and, um, and with a two week old, it's a lot of attention that the baby needs and, and so Maya had Fallen asleep, Julie had fallen asleep, and, the, and what we have learned was when the baby sleeps, you sleep. Because if, if you try to do work when the baby's sleeping, then you're not going to have any time to sleep at all because when the baby's awake, you're awake. But this was one of those times where I couldn't fall asleep, and I had this research project I was, I was itching to start working on, but a two week old, I have to, you know, I can't quite work on that right now. But, but what happened was, um, you know, my went to bed, Julie went to bed, and I just couldn't fall asleep. And I was like, all right, I'm going to go in the garage. I hadn't gone in the garage in, in probably about three or four weeks at that point. Um, and, and I was itching to build something. Like I, rem like I mentioned, one of my hobbies is building stuff. And then we were working on this research project uh, on a new sensor, and I was t trying to teach this new class you know, a few months after um, my uh, paternity leave. And so, uh, so what I did was I ended up going in the garage, and I said, well, what does Maya really need right now? So she was born in November. Um, and it turned out one of the most frustrating things for me, I mean, I was a first-time parent, so I didn't really know how to deal with this, was how to know when she was actually, you know, she pooped in her pants or, or in, in, in the diaper or when she was wet. And she was all wrapped up because it was November, it was cold, so she was all, you know, so swaddled, and then it, she had layers and layers of clothing on. It's like, all right, I can figure this out. I can build a sensor that can detect when she peed or pooped in her pants um, or in the diaper. And so what, that's what I did. So I spent that evening, it took me about eight hours, and I built this little device that's about a one inch by one inch device. Um, and it turns out modern diapers are really great. If you look at the outside of the diaper, when they pee in the diaper, it, it changes color. There's a little strip that changes from yellow to blue. And so I essentially bu built a one pixel camera, right? And all it does is, and it, it doesn't get dirty, it's on the outside of the diaper. Because everybody's always come up with a solution where you put it in the diaper, and then it gets wet and it's dirty, you gotta dispose of it. So what we said was, well, what can we do on the outside of the diaper? So built this little device, one inch by one inch, one has a little coin cell, CR2035 coin cell battery on it, Bluetooth to the phone, and, and you stick it, you just use, <laughs> and you just use medical tape, just a little medical tape, and you stick it on the outside of the diaper. It's really easy, you just line up that strip with that little sensor, and then whenever it changes from yellow to blue, you get a text message. <laughs> and, um, and, so, and, so, and so it worked well. So, and so, you know, is, is she crabby because she is what? Um, well, it, it didn't turn blue, so probably not. Um, and it turns out, and everybody, would, everybody always asks, and what if she poops? Well, it turns out poop has enough liquid in that it'll change the color as well. Um, and, so, and so this is combined a lot of things. One was, how do I figure out if she's wet or not? Secondly, um, God, I gotta go into the garage, I gotta build something. Third was, I gotta figure out how to, this, to the, 
I used a new PCB layout technique and I was going to teach in a class, so I figured that out. And I figured out how to use this new sensor that I was building for our research. And I combined it all. And, and, it, and, and in the end, it was kind of funny what happens. So Julie f posted on Facebook, and one of my colleagues from many years ago saw, who used to be at Procter & Gamble saw it, and then you know, now, now people are going to take it forward. And I, like, <laughs> more power to you. <laughs> so at some point, you might get a box of 125 pack of diapers, and you'll see this little sensor you pair it to your iPhone or your Android. But, um, but, but that's one example where Internet some, of the Internet of Things, right? <laughs> Uh, little did you know you could put one on a diaper. Um, but, but that was an example of kind of combining four or five things that I, ha I wanted to do. I didn't have to do, but I was able to do it. And then Julie wakes up. She's like, what the hell were you working on all night? And then I show it to her. She was still sleep deprived, and she's like, this is dumb. But then, then eventually, she, re reflecting on it, it was actually pretty, kind of pretty fascinating in the end. It ends up being a funny story for a lot of people. But, um, but one of the things I want to um, uh, mention is that uh, so Julie was talking about how, you know, for women, you know, the assumption is that when you have a kid um, that you're going to, you know, take an extended leave. We didn't do that. We took a paternity and maternity leave. We took it together. Instead of staging it where, you know, Julie will take three months, I'll take three months, and we got six months covered, that didn't really make sense. We wanted to do it together because we wanted to learn together. So we took the three months off. You know, UW is very progressive about this stuff. They give paternity and maternity leaves. We took it together, and then we went back to work. Um, uh, and we figured out daycare, we figured those things out. But one of the things that I would always get is, all right, you have a kid, so that means you know, Julie's now staying at home, so you shouldn't impact you. It's like, what? What do you mean? Or some people may be like, oh, you have so many things you do, you must have a really supportive wife that's able to look after the kids and do all these things at home. Uh, no. Uh, and I, I get great joy in telling them that my wife is a tenured professor who has an active research program, in fact, is more productive than I am, and can still handle both of those. And, and, and it's just frustrating that that's the first thing that people assume, right? And, and that's, that doesn't make any sense to me. And so I, make it a, I made it a choice for me that Julie was not going to take a leave. I will take the leave before she ever takes the leave, right? And I did not want her to make that decision. And so together, we've basically made a decision to figure out how do we control all those burners. And in fact, we all have, we both have four burners that we're going to be igniting at the same time. Um, so, so let's just kind of step through these. Let's talk about family first. Um, so the way we approach family is kind of how we approach our personal life, or our, our professional life. You know, for, you know when I'm find, founding a startup, when I'm doing a research project, what do you do? Well, first of all, you have a set of tools, right? You have some tools that you use to manage your professional career. Uh, you, you might use a scrum method or you might use agile or whatever. There's tools, right? There's techniques that you use to basically manage that. Um, you have a set of principles. You might have some short-term, long-term goals. I'm not saying you, want, you need to have a roadmap for your family, but I'm just saying that in, in, your, in your professional career, you have short-term and long-term goals. Um, you also have you, think, you keep things fresh, right? If you create a product that's stagnating, well, nobody's going to buy it, right? So you're innovating and you're iterating. That's how we approach our family life. It, it, we're always trying to keep it fresh. I mean, it's really fun the first couple of years when you get married, but then you've got to keep it fresh, right? You have to create new stories and new shared experiences. You kind of do this in your professional careers as well. You create new opportunities, new technology, new exciting uh, innovation. Why can't you not do that with your family? So we do that. I mean, we have Google Docs that we use to basically have a to-do list of what we're going to hit. Marking things off on a list is actually pretty exciting, right? Um, and, and this is a way to kind of consolidate things that we may forget. And so we've done things like, um, so Julie found this really awesome blog where they talked about cool ways of doing date night. And so we adapted it a little bit and, and did this thing called ABC date night, which was you take every letter on the alphabet and we alternate. And you have to, do, you have to come up with a date night scenario or event that starts with that letter, right? So A, I did archery, all right? It was really fun. Um, and then and, and it, it keeps it fresh, right? It, and it's something, I mean, X, you know, X is kind of hard, but you can kind of imagine what could it be, right? Um, um, uh, so, uh, so H H was hot air balloon rides. So hot air balloons, so if some of you from Seattle probably know about all those hot air balloons over Kirkland. And H was, and that was actually a fun story. So it, it, later at dinner or rece reception this evening, you want to tell, we should tell you about that story. Uh, we kind of had a, little, little, a mini crash. <laughs> but it was fun. It was fun. Um, and we'd do it again. Um, and then uh, what else did we, what are, what are the other ones that we uh, had? We're, uh, we're currently working on, um, so since we have a daughter and you have, Seattle also has a bunch of awesome parks. We went through the uh, Seattle Parks website and found there's over 420 parks 
in Seattle, and there's a lot of little ones too. So we, we decided our cutoff was three acres or greater. We're going to visit every single park. Yeah, uh, yeah, so Se that, or, yeah Seattle has, yeah, we have a lot of parks. Uh, and I wrote a so script. So we have a spreadsheet, yeah, yeah. and so we're uh, here we keeping track, <laughs> taking <laughs> photos at each one. Well, we wrote a script to yeah. basically figure out well, which parks we want to go to. There's 400 parks, they're little dinky little parks too, but what 400, what are the actual parks we want to go to? There's yeah. about 160 of them. Yeah. The three acres are bigger, that has at least, you know, two things there, so you have a playground. And so we just wrote a simple Python script to do this. And so there's over, <laughs> so there's over 160, and our our mission with Maya is to enjoy each one of these parks, write a little little, little piece about it, and take a picture, and then and th that's going to consume a couple of years. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so so these are little things that we could do, and, and we have a to-do list for all the stuff, right? And so we'll just take one at a, one at a time, and then create these new experiences and new stories. Yeah, and for other family stuff, you know, um, you know this is sort of cliche, but we really do uh, uh, appreciate quality over quantity. So, you know, obviously since we work a lot, um, your daughter's in daycare full time, we don't necessarily see her as much as, as someone who would stay home full time. And so, you know, we really, really try to make the time that we do spend with her count. Um, and one of the things we realized was that, you know, starting to go, go we got into our routine, you know, pick her up, drop her off at daycare, um, we really would sort of veg out in the evenings and sort of kind of individual, you know, go our individual ways, like we might retreat into our devices or those sorts of things. And so we decided to actually make that time explicitly family time. And so, you know, from the moment we pick her up from daycare, like we put our phones, I, you know, I, I would used to sit in my in the, in the car on the way home, we carpool. Um, and uh, like read Facebook and stuff like that, and you know, Shwetik was driving or something like that, and we'd ignore each other. So we decided phones in the car, phones are off limits until Maya goes to bed at night, um, which is about 7, 7.30. Um, so we really, really make that time sacred. So we try to really, really focus. Um, we, we cook dinner together, we um, you know, have dinner, we play, read books, you know, with all those sorts of things. The only rule is that you can use technology, but it has to be together. So it's okay if you know, we sit together and like do some stuff on the iPad or FaceTime with Shreddick's parents or those sorts of things, but it has to be together as a family. Um, likewise, we try to make weekends pretty sacred as well um, in terms of, especially mornings. You know, nap times are sort of you know, still, uh, when, when, for as long as she's napping. This is getting worse, but um, so uh, um, you know we can do work stuff during that time as well. But we really try to keep the time that we're with her dedicated to just family time. Um, so um, the other thing that we've learned to realize is just to stop feeling guilty about it. So I read so many parenting books. Uh, well, we both did. We went to all these classes uh, when we were pregnant, and when I was pregnant. Uh, and you know, we, we learned about like oh things like attachment parenting and really intensive parenting, and you must be with your child 24/7 or they're going to go crazy, and you know they're gonna, not going to become attached to you. And we just sort of decided that wasn't really our personality. You know, we love our daughter, we spend a lot of time with her, um, but you know we were okay with not subscribing to the intensive parenting that seems to be the, the norm these days uh, for a lot of people. Um, and also just coming to the realization that you know, we're not going to have Pinterest perfect parties uh, every time you. Know, uh, we're not going to have like the like cute little uh, crafty. I'm not going to crochet little like crafty things for her. You know those sorts of things. Um, you know I'm just not going to even try uh, to 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 reach that that level of aspiration. And, and I'm totally okay with that. And I think the two of us are as well. Um, so other things we do. You know we we do use technology quite a bit. Um, you know I keep like Facebook groups for my family to keep in touch. You know, we FaceTime with with Shadok's parents. We do a lot of stuff to kind of keep our, our family intact that way. Um, that's uh, second burner. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna. Uh, I right. guess I can take on the second. And the other thing is, that we're not really good cooks. Oh, so yeah. we, we, I mean, so we, we made it. So one of the things that we wanted to do was, uh, you know, be great cooks. And then when Maya came, it was, it, it was, it was hard to do that. And so we said, well, we'll do cooking together. So we have this little stool that we have for her, perfect height, it's pretty safe, and that we pull up and we have it around the, the the island, and we cook together. We're not great at it, but Maya gets to participate, and it's really the, the that that quality experience is what's great, I think. Uh, and, and these little things, I think help. Yeah, and related to that, and this is kind of getting to the health thing as well, is that we realized, you know, we were eating out a lot or getting takeout and stuff, and it's not really that healthy, so we need to do better about it, but then we were just sort of swamped with that. And so we came to the agreement that we're like, okay, we're going to learn to make six meals really well, and that's it. <laughs> we're going to buy those groceries, we'll know exactly what to buy each week, and we'll probably get tired of it and, you know, have to do it. But we didn't be able to maintain that for, for quite a while, and that really just really cut out the cognitive load about like, oh, what are we going to make? And you know, what are we going to have tonight? So that was sort of one thing that we had done um, as a compromise and realizing it's like, okay, we're not going to be world-class chefs. So. And we could tweak those a little bit. And, then, yeah. and the nice thing about focusing on six is that <laughs> Amazon Fresh is just a pretty easy button click away. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, <laughs> by, by, about health. Uh, so health is an, 
interesting one because I think health was a unique opportunity to combine some of these burners. Um, so when Maya was just old enough um, to uh, have us, so she would wear her helmet, uh, one of the things we did was we got a bike trailer for her. She loves getting pulled around in a trailer. And so that allowed us to do something that we really enjoyed. In Seattle, biking is really fun. There's a lot of opportunity to bike. And so that's, that was a family weekend outing that we would do. And we would bike as much as we could, how much she could stand, and she would usually just fall asleep so we could bike for a long time. And so we would combine a lot of those things. A lot of the indoor kind of routines that we would do, workout routines that we had to do, like weights and stuff, uh, we actually created these little games for her. So while Julie and I were working out, either really early in the morning or right before we put her to bed, um, we'd have these little games. And in fact, we got this little mini yoga, yoga mat for her. She likes to mimic things. And so she'd roll it out, and she would go after each one of the little images, and she would try to mimic it. And she loves going upside down. She likes doing all these <laughs> postures and poses anyway. And so we made a game out of it. And so she, by the time she would you know, finish one round of it, we'd, actually, we'd be able to get a bunch of routines in as well. So, so we were able to make interesting, fun games for her so that it wasn't where it, you know, we didn't have to take her to a daycare or go to a gym where she was at the daycare and we were working out. We were able to combine it by having her participate participate in it and her actually understand that, oh, mommy and daddy are working out, I'm playing my game, but, they, but she kind of understood what was happening. And it took a lot of effort to figure that out, but I think it, it, it helps in the long run in that she understands what we're doing and she knows what she could do to help participate in that. Yeah, and you know, other things, you know, um, uh, Sedaris doesn't really define what health is, and, and so we kind of took it a broad approach and thought about things like mental health. Uh, so we're really, you know, we really try to take um, vacations when we can. You know, we have to, you know, you, with the amount of work and, and everything, you really have to. And so, um, you know, we try to take one sort of adventure type vacation and then one sort of relaxing vacation every year. So last year we went to Africa, left uh, Maya at home with my family, which is really great, um, and got you know ten days of, of really really fun adventure. Um, and then we you know went to Hawaii over. Uh, uh, Christmas, just to sort of have a, a relaxing. So we the really try to. The problem is, I don't relax. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't relax. Yeah, the first time I took him to a beach, uh, we were dating, uh, and we, we went to the beach in Georgia. We, we uh, met in, in Atlanta, and uh, I, I get down, I lay on my towel, I get my book, and, and he's just like, "Okay, now what?" <laughs> I'm like, "It's like." This is it. This is what we do on the beach. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, I'm gonna go walk around. And like, he's like, threw a frisbee to himself. It was really funny. He's like, so he's since he's since learned to, to tone it down a little bit. But <laughs> but that was sort of a, a fun thing I realized early on in our relationship. So. Um, but yeah, so we really try to do mental health stuff. Um, we try to keep up with hobbies. Um, I've tried to combine health hobbies, or make hobbies about health, um, especially now. I used to play tons of video games as a kid, and you know, I started to feel a, a little guilty about that and how what it was doing to my health. So I've sort of transitioned that into, now I do things like zombies run and stuff and try to make them a little about health. I like connect games and those sorts of things. So turning that interest into um, you know, more healthy activities as well has been sort of some adaptation that I've done. Um, yeah, as Shreddick mentioned, he has tons of crazy hobbies, uh, so he keeps his garage workshop pretty busy. <laughs> and I'll just come home randomly, and uh, one day I came home, he called me from home, he's like, I'm gonna go home for a little bit, and it was fine, so I just, um, he took the bus home. And I come home, and he taught himself welding. <laughs> it's like, he went, we got a welder, uh, decided he's gonna teach himself, and there's this big metal contraption in the garage. He's like, what are you doing? <laughs> so he, uh, you know, he just will randomly do those things. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it brings up an interesting point, hobbies, um, you know, so, I mean, hobbies aren't really on here. And wh where does hobbies fit? I mean, is it a fifth burner? Does it cut across everything? And I think it does kind of cut across everything. I mean, one of the things that, you know, a lot of us in the room and some of the things that, you know, we focus on is that, you know, our work is our hobby a lot of times. I mean, we're doing the things that we're passionate about. We, are, we have fun at work. Um, as being academics and researchers, we can focus on things that we, we like to do. And so a lot of times our hobbies are at work too. But sometimes you gotta be able to break away from that. And I, I like taking a step back and, and not talking shop all the time and, 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 and you know, doing something that's very different. Uh, the unfortunate thing about some of my hobbies is that it's not, it's in, in, it's not compatible with a two-year-old. I, mean, I mean, a welder, you can't, I mean, I can't have her in the garage. Um, and some of the, you know, the mill stuff, I mean, I can't have her there. But although I've taught her some things, I mean, she's really good at finding tools for me. Uh, so if you ever see her in the hallways, you can ask her what the difference between an impact wrench and a hammer drill is and she will tell you. <laughs> um, and, and so, I mean, so she's really good at retrieving things, and she's really good at learning. I say, what's that, Daddy? Oh, I'll tell you what that, uh, that is. Um, so so and that's really difficult for me. So these, these hobbies are really incompatible with our other burners because it's, you know, it's something that we can't participate in as a family. I mean, we can't do welding as a family. So what I have made a conscious decision of is I got to cut into one of the burners, and I cut into work. All right, so that was a good example of, I took that day off, I said, you know, there's a couple meetings, I don't need to go to these meetings, I canceled the meetings, I went home, learned how to weld, I built this contraption, it actually worked pretty well, by the way. Um, 
And, and, this is, and that's what I do. So if it's something I really want to do and I'm itching to do it, the only thing I'll cut into is work, all right? And my, my, my students, my teams understand that. They know how I am. In fact, I encourage them to do it, all right? And so I think we have this uh, uh, shared uh, perspective at work with my research team and my, and my colleagues that if, I, if I'm off doing something at home, it's because I'm you know, doing something fun. And I encourage them to do the same thing. So I think we understand that at work. Um, but, but, but I think hobbies is important. I think that's how I keep my sanity and how a lot of people keep their sanity. But I, I think combining is important, but sometimes you've got to take a step back and try to figure out another way of doing that. And for me, it's, it's, I'm, I can be a little bit less productive at work uh, if I want to keep my sanity. Yeah, and so um, I think that takes us to the third burner, which is friends. So we kind of talked about this a little bit already, which is you know, we, we make friends with people who are kids, and so we hang out, um, do kind of combine family and friends at the same time. Uh, we also combine work with friends. So um, we're fortunate that we're pretty flexible in the types of things we work on. Um, and a lot of you who are kind of starting your own businesses and things have a lot of say in who you work with. And if we just find people that we really enjoy working with um, and that are also our friends, um, you know, you know, and, and that's a high priority. It's like, well, I would rather work on sort of maybe a less interesting project um, to be able to work with someone who's just really amazing to be with and really fun to be with. And so we really try to help um, you know, boost up our friend stuff by also thinking about how we can involve that in work as well. Um, other things is that we're both introverts, believe it or not, uh, and so we like to keep a smaller circle of closer friends, um, and so that makes maintenance a little bit easier because uh, we have a smaller group. But um, the other thing we do is we try to find um, friends who are sort of in similar uh, situations to us. You also have sort of these, you know, this desire to c combine all these burners and, and do everything um, because it makes them more understanding as well. So if we don't see them for a month or so, they're not going to get mad and, and get upset or cause a bunch of drama. What are you, you must not love me anymore. So you know, we're just naturally attracted to the type of people um, who you know, kind of have similar goals as us, and that really helps. And you know, when we were reflecting about this and talking about it together, we realized that's kind of what attracted us to each other in the first place, too, is that you know, we, were, we met in graduate school. We were both working on our PhDs uh, um, at Georgia Tech, and you know, we were studying for a qualifying exam, and <laughs> you know, we're realizing it's like, hey, it's actually pretty great to have someone uh, you know, that you know, understands what the stresses are, um, knows what you're going through, um, and you know, that's how we fell in love. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but then we just you know, came to realize is, you know, it was more than just a romantic thing, it was sort of forming this partnership, and that was really important to us, is sort of understanding each other, knowing that you know, there's, uh, sometimes we're gonna come against crazy deadlines, sometimes we're gonna have to put in that 80 hour week if we really need to get something out. Um, and so we can know that we can sort of step up and understand that. And I think that's the same reason you find like celebrities dating each other because they understand the stresses of that. And you find that often in, in other as well. And that's been really true for us is to, to sort of you know, make a relationship about, um, you know, yeah, that understanding and finding that. And not everyone's the same. We know plenty of people in, in our field who's like, I would never date another professor. That's a horrible idea. Um, but for us, it really does work. And so it's nice to sort of reflect and acknowledge that. Um, yeah, let's... and so, I mean, so that, I mean, that could be a good time to transition to work then. Yeah. Um, and we saved work for last just because there's a lot of nuances there. I mean, work, uh, there's a lot of, I mean, I, we could give a whole talk on time management. So we're not going to bore you on bore you to death on time management. But I think that's critical um, uh, in, in that I became very efficient uh, when, we had, when, when we had Maya. I mean, I would, pro I mean, I would contend I was, I'm probably the best procrastinator. I, could, I, could, I mean, I, I'm good at procrastinating. Um, and uh, um, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, I, I could do it as the best of anybody. Um, but but, but when, we had Maya, when, we, when Maya was born, I, I really had to change the way I operated at home and at, at work. Um, I, I make sure a lot of the things that I do at at, at UW get done there because I had that buffer where I could do that in the evening if I had a little bit of work or some things that I had to do. Because as being a professor, it's not a nine to five. It's, it's you basically have, you're working until the thing that you need to get done gets done. It's like having a startup and too. it's never done. And it's never done. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I had to become pretty efficient. And, um, and I get, I mean, we get a lot of requests for things. Uh, I get asked to do lots of due diligence for companies. Uh, I get asked to do a lot of keynotes, a lot of talks. And so what I realized was, I mean, I learned how to say no early. I mean, that's one of the first things you learn as a, being a faculty member, junior faculty members, learn how to say no. But it's hard to say no because it's so flattering when you get asked to do these great things. <laughs> and so what I said was, all right, I'm going to learn how to say no. But I'm not just going to learn how to say no. I'm going to learn how to say, what are the, some, what are the things I'm going to always say yes to? All right? So there's something, there are some things I will not say no to. The things that I will not say no to is if an undergrad comes to me and say, ask advice on career or what to do, I will not say no to that. 
I will figure that out, all right? Um, if a high school student comes to me, so I run a high school outreach program over the summer, I will never say no to that. I will always engage a high school student. Um, and there's a handful of things I will always do, right? And so I have a list of those, and I will make that work. There's some things I will uh, say no to just because I just don't have the time for that. And there are some things that are just valuable enough that I know if I took the risk and engaged in that conversation, I think something great would come out of it. Well, how do you not say no to that? And so one of the things I've done is I've created this universal office hour thing. So it's just like how in the academic space you have office hours for students. Here's some time that you can drop by to chat with me. But this office hour is not just for my students or for the university, it's for anybody. So if you're in the Seattle area, here's the, here are my office hours, and they change every quarter, so, I, so they can't just drop by. They gotta actually find what my office hours are for that quarter, and people come by. They stop by, they have chats. And it, it makes it so much easier to manage my calendar because then it doesn't get fragmented. Right? And I know that they're taking it seriously. If they're, take, if they're taking the initiative to take the bus down to UW to come to my office hours to chat with me, I mean, I think this is, this is a serious thing. And so that's what I've done. I've consolidated a lot of those open requests to a one hour period during that week. All right? And it's not just for the students, it's for anybody in the community. And for people that are outside the community, they can just call me up. I just have an open Skype account, you just Skype me, right? And I will be open at that time, right? I might be in a conversation with somebody else, I'll put you on hold, but this is a, but this is one way that I, I, I've been able to manage some of my time. Yeah, and, and I'd say do, I actually adopted that from Schwedek, because that's a great thing about having a, a spouse that you know, knows that you feel. And so, you know, it's, in, in the beginning, I was like, why do professors have office hours? That's crazy, I'll just meet with you whenever. And then you realize that, you know, it fills up your time very, very quickly. So yeah, I started to do office hours as well. Um, and I will, you know, obviously there's sometimes people have really strong needs and conflicts. So again, I do, I take a similar approach where if it's someone talk, wants to talk about career advice or those sorts of things, I will prioritize that. But um, I try to do that. The other thing I try to do is, um, um, Shradik mentioned it's often very flattering to get asked to do a lot of things. Um, and so it's been, it's been great, but you know, it can really eat into your time and sort of take away the time that you have to work on the other stuff that you're supposed to get done. Um, so I've started to implement what I, I've been doing like a 24 hour rule. Um, so anytime I get asked to do something, a big project, engage in something new, I always want to say yes and get really excited about it. Um, but I realized that that initial excitement is, is often gets me in trouble and I find myself overcommitted. So um, I decided to sit on the request for at least 24 hours, talk it over with Shwedek, um, think about do I actually have time to take this on and do it well? Because um, I don't want to just take on too much. Um, so you know, usually then I take the time to reflect um, and then have that, that 24 hour window. And a lot of times, and then I feel much better about saying yes and I don't regret it later because I took that time to, to sort of think it over before I immediately said yes just because I was really excited about it in the first place. Um, so the other thing with work for me was minimizing context switching. Um, so I realized I was sort of, you know, I would fragment my schedule so I'd have like a student meeting here, I have to write letters of recommendation, I have to prepare for class, I have to write grants, I have to review grants, I have to re do peer review stuff, I have to write papers, I have to do all these things. Um, and so it was just the variety of things that I had to work on was driving me crazy. Um, and so for me it was really trying to minimize context switching. Oh, and now I'm starting this nonprofit, and so that's like another thing. And so I've started to segment my days. So I'll have like, you know, Monday will be teaching days, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays Thursdays or meet with my PhD students to talk about research days. Um, Wednesdays are like my meeting days of other things like for you know, PhD admissions or, or graduate admissions or faculty hiring or those sorts of things. So I do all my sort of service things that day. Um, and then um, next year I'm going on sabbatical so I'll be able to dedicate uh, two or three days to my nonprofit to work on that for my project. So really kind of designating set amount of times to minimize that context switching is really important for me. Yeah, and I, I do something similar where um, uh, I, I make sure my boundaries are clear because I, have, I wear many hats and the hats don't quite overlap. And so if I'm at the startup or if I'm doing uh, some advisory stuff, uh, I, I make it clear what days I'm engaging with that and what days are off limits because my day job is a professor and there's just some things I cannot take a step back from. And so I, I make those boundaries clear and, so, and, and that, those expectations are set. My, the expectations is that I can't be around all the time for everything. I mean, if there's something major going on, then I will definitely you know, um, uh, set up to do that and, uh, and tweak the schedule to, to set up for that. But, um, but I think making the boundaries clear is the way I had to do that. The, um, uh, the other thing is that um, I often, just like in fa with family, you know, quanti quality is better than quantity. So when I engage with my team, um, I always have meetings with them. I, always, I mean, I have weekly meetings with each one of my team members, but I also do these informal things. So it's actually more valuable for me to actually sit in the lab and hack code and build things with them than to just have this office relationship where they come to my office and have meetings that way. And so I make it a priority that I have this, this time which is blocked off that n no meetings get set there. It looks like a meeting to my, uh, my administrator, but, but what it is is it's, I'm in the lab having lunch with my lab, or I'm actually there hacking code or, or building something with them. And I found that um, creating loose 
uh, times, like so, so very flexible meeting times, is more valuable than having set times that I will always engage with, you know, a, a team member. And I think that makes it really nice because it's very flexible. We can we can. Um, uh, engage in all kinds of topics because sometimes it might not be work or research related. It could just be about personal things, and so I think that, that I, that's got, I think that's helped a lot in, in having the flexible time and informal time that I'm always with them. All right, um, um, so uh, so I think yeah, time management is is critical, but but it, it's it's changing all the time as well. So you know, dif depending on if we take it on another gig or if we're dropping a gig, that that gets changed every quarter for us. But these are kind of the high level bits that we focus on. Um, um, yeah, I was going to bring up another point, um, which is that um, you know, one of the things that we're you're thinking bringing back to the other burners as well is so uh, when I was a junior faculty member on the tenure track, you know, the, I was reading all these books because that's what I do, uh, and you know, one of the books I was reading was called Professor Mommy, I think was the book, uh, and it was talking about how if you are pre-tenure, do not say anything about kids, do not pretend to be you know like you completely separate your family and work, um, you know, don't have pictures of your kids up, um, pretend like you're not pregnant, you know, when you're pregnant, and, you know, like, don't ever mention this thing, and that just seemed absurd to me, because, like, it felt like I was not um, who I was, um, and so I went and I talked to my, my senior colleagues, and I was like, is this, or, and, you know, I have mentors and stuff, so I was like, is this true? Should I avoid this? And, and, and they said, uh, no. <laughs> uh, that's really weird. Uh, so yeah, I plastered my whole wall of my office with kids and <laughs> pictures of my daughter. Um, you'll talk about you know, uh, you know, the trials and tribulations of, of having kids with my students as well. Because um, I really feel like you know, that's actually harming a lot of people as well. Because they see you know, successful women and they don't see the family side of it and they just assume that you can't have that. So I felt like it's my duty to, to try and step up and be a role model and show that I can be you know, a professor and a parent and do this stuff um, and not try to hide it. Not try to hide the fact you know, my daughter's sick and I gotta go pick her up from daycare. I don't actually say, um, you know, oh, I have an errand I need to run. I actually say, like, oh, my daughter's sick, I need to go home. I'm very, very honest about that because it just doesn't seem very honest at all to, to try and hide that from people. And, and you know, it's interesting because everyone has all these ideas about it. And, you know, I, I think that um, it actually makes me more efficient. And I, I tell people, you know, they want to schedule evening events with me. I was like, I'm sorry, I can't do between five and seven. I'm happy to call you after my daughter goes to bed. Um, so I, I try to be very honest about that. And I also make sure I do the same thing because, <laughs> uh, you know, people say the same thing. And I realized, you know, for a while it was like, oh, I can't because I have to go pick up my daughter. And he would just like, oh, I can't do it. And I was like, huh, <laughs> that's kind of interesting. So I actually make him now say, oh, I can't because I have to go pick up my daughter. Because, um, you know, the same thing, you know, we should both be doing these things and it should be setting the expectation that both parents should be you know, parenting as well. Um, so that's been a really good thing to do. <laughs> Thanks. So I will go pick up Maya. Yes. <laughs> no, I, and it's actually interesting. Um, that she, Julie brings up an interesting point. Well, uh, when I started to say that, oh, I, I got to go pick up Maya, I have a hard deadline at 5 o'clock, I don't care where this meeting is, I'm leaving. I'm like, oh, can Julie do that? Like, no, Julie can't do that. And if you say that one more time, I'm not going to come to this meeting ever again, right? And, and, and the assumption is that, as the father, why are you picking her up from daycare? Why would I not pick her up from daycare? It's probably the best time. I mean, walking into daycare and her running up to me and saying, Daddy, is probably the best highlight of my day, right? Um, and so and why would I not do that? Um, and so, yeah, so, and so, it's, so you know, one of the things that it, the assumptions, we have to break these assumptions. It's just, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, and... Um, and I guess the, one of the last topics we want to talk about is, you know, um, we talked about combining burners. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about um, when you might not want to combine burners or be, or, or be a little bit more conscious about when combining burners might be problematic or, 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 or might be a challenge. And so one example here is that, you know, Julia, Julia and I are in the same field. Uh, we do similar but complementary research. Um, and so we could collaborate on every project we do. In fact, in grad school, we did collaborate. Right now, we collaborate on some projects, but not a lot. And this is something when we were uh, junior faculty that we realized was it was very convenient to have Julie next to me all the time. Because you know, she, if, I have, if I had a research idea, if I had a paper or some talk I was doing, I could easily get her feedback, moment's notice. That's so, I mean, just think about how powerful that is, right? Having somebody to give you feedback uh, at any moment, and, and I think that, I think that's great. And what, what happened was I became complacent and lazy. And so during the day, I, was, I would say to myself, oh, I don't really need to get feedback right now. I'll just get Julie to help me. But what happened was that happened quite often. We'd always create, in a way, work for each other. So when we come home, 
It's like, oh, Julie, can you take a look at this? And Julie would give me something. It's like, wait a minute, we're doing this quite often. In fact, <laughs> way too often. And we're creating more work for each other than we needed to. And so what we've done is we've made a conscious effort to limit that. In fact, we rarely try to create work for each other, only when we really need to. If we're in a bind or if we actually have this major deadline, that's when we would do that. But now we've actually made it a, an, an effort that you, know, you just can't do that all the time. I think there's boundaries and limits. And I think that was something that we learned. It took us you know, a year or two to learn that, but that's actually re uh, allowed us to save a lot of time between each other so that we can go off and do our own things if we need to. Right, and so um, we're joining just about out of time, so kind of wanted to think. Um, so we, this is a really fun exercise. We talked about it for a while. Um, and one of the things we realized is at the end, we started thinking, well, how far can we take this burner metaphor, right? So we started to think about, like, well, what if we have a six burner stove? What does that look like? <laughs> or um, you know, what if we run out of gas, right? What is that? Or if there's a gas leak, how do we fix that? Or how do we keep Maya from getting burned? Or what if we burn the house? And then we started to just, the, the, the whole conversation devolved yeah, this, in this ridiculousness. Yeah, and this we was just, a brainstorming that Yeah, we yeah. We both just started laughing. And I think that the, the thing that we realized in the end was that, you know, I think the main thing that makes this possible is like, we, we do suck at a lot of things. You know, we, we do some things well, but you know, we, there's a lot of things that we don't feel, you know, we feel at. We know some of these days we're going to like um, turn on the burner too high, completely burn out, burn dinner. Um, and that's okay. We've we're just, dinner before. We have burned dinner, yeah. <laughs> and so we realize it's like, you know, it's just mostly not taking ourselves too seriously, keeping the humor about, um, you know, having that relationship, you know, being able to laugh at the mistakes that we make is, is probably the most important thing to be able to do this. Um, and not really just taking ourselves so seriously. Yeah. So yeah, sometimes you know, we'll get in yeah. an argument, and then we end up looking at each other and start <laughs> laughing. Yeah. How do we get into that argument? <laughs> and so it's, yeah. and I think it's because we understand each other not not only just so well personally, but professionally, but across the board. I think being able to work on these burners together, I think has has allowed us to have a, a interesting relationship where I think it cuts across many of these different facets that I think I think it's just going to make us stronger. Yeah, and you know this is this is a really great exercise. I really want to thank Jason for making us do that, and yeah. really encourage you guys to do this. Well, you know, we're this we're telling our personal story, and we're obviously very different people. Um, so it actually was a really great exercise. I think it'd be good for everyone to kind of go through this, think about this, you think about you know you, where you fit into this, think about if you are willing to shut any of those things off, what strategies you might do, because we never really taken the time to stop and reflect on that. And it's actually a really really great um, exercise to do, um, both because as individuals and then also um, together with your partner. So really would encourage everyone to, to kind of take through that because it was a really different <laughs> experience. So I really appreciate the, the time that, that it took to do that. So um, I think we're about out of time. So um, we're, like I said, we're here through Wednesday. So we're happy to kind of continue this conversation with people and tell you more things if we can or talk to you about those things. Yeah. If you have any other questions, just find us in the hallway or find us here. And then we'd love to talk about uh, how we try to pull this off. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Great.